Well, good evening. Welcome to class number uh, five of our CSE class 104. I apologize for my voice. I was preaching in Pennsylvania this week and I overdid it or something. <clears throat> Can't talk very well. We'll try to um, get this out as well as possible. So uh, listen carefully. We left off uh, talking about the flood in the days of Noah in Genesis chapter 8, verse number 1. It has a very interesting verse. It tells us the waters assuaged. Um, during the flood, all sorts of things were formed. The natural gas was formed. The coal uh, formation would have come in uh, during the flood and because of the flood. Down near the South Pole, it's interesting. If you read, uh, you look at National Geographic map of the South Pole, it says they found anthracite coal near the South Pole. And leaves and all sorts of things found. Well, there's, there's no plants growing on Antarctica, so how do you get coal at the South Pole? One explanation is the South Pole used to be up near the equator. I think that's a lousy explanation, but that's the one that's in the textbooks. The other explanation is the whole Earth used to have a more tropical paradise. Stuff lived everywhere. And the continents today is a pure coincidence based upon the water level. If you raise or lower the water, everything changes. And what it was like before the flood, there's absolutely no way to tell, as far as I can figure out. Garden of Eden could have been right here in Pensacola, Florida. Right now it might be under 500 feet of mud. Some people have argued, oh, well, the river Euphrates is mentioned in the Bible as being in the Garden of Eden. That's true. And the river Euphrates is in Baghdad. Well, this river Euphrates is. It doesn't mean it's the same thing. People got off the ark and they probably said, wow, that looks like that river we had before the flood. And they named it the same thing. Just like uh, people came from York and named it New York when they got over here and New Hampshire and all those kind of things. I was in uh, up near Moscow, Idaho. Well, it's not the same as Moscow, Russia. It just has the same name, that's all. So, after, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> in Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, it tells us, God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. Now, many new versions of the Bible have changed this, and I think have, have messed it up. They say the water receded. Well, this word assuage means to drop down or to sink down, to subside. This is the word used when someone's anger is assuaged. It drops down. It doesn't um, move away. It just d drops down. It's very different. Um, the water assuaged, meaning the water just began to drop down. I suspect what happened is parts of the crust of the earth sank down, sucking the water into the low place. Other places would lift up forming mountain ranges. If you look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 2, it says, The waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. There are several different stages to the flood. The 40 days of rain, 150 days of the water having dominion or power over the earth, and then 150 days of going down. That's five months. So parts of the earth's crust were probably exposed off and on during this year-long flood. Noah was in the ark for a year. Um, the flood didn't necessarily last a year, but Noah stayed in the ark for one year. He got in seven days before it started, and about 13 months total he was actually in the ark. So probably sections of the earth's crust were not inundated, not underwater the whole time. The crust would be bouncing around, floating up and down. Sometimes you might even get a section that would come up and totally dry out for a few months and may even, maybe even get windblown uh, sandstone uh, stone formed. Uh, there's sand, when it blows and drifts like sand dunes, it makes layers. Sometimes there are petrified sand dunes inside layers of sedimentary rock. You have rock, and then rock, and then sandstone, and then more rock. And the evolutionist says, see, this was above uh, water. Yeah, sure was, you're right about that. Because this couldn't form underwater. Well. I disagree, I disagree with that. There have been, uh, if you fly over the beach, you'll see right down through the water, you can see the, the wave action makes all kinds of sedimentation in the water, out under the water. You know, a lot of sedimentation does form. So the, even during the flood, you may get an awful lot of uh, underwater sedimentation of sand that will then pack and dry out. When it lifts up, it'll become above water level and turn to uh, like a petrified sand dune, sort of. Um, but after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. I have highlighted here the words, returned from off the earth continually. This is the Hebrew words, halak vashab, which means going and returning. 
This gives the indication the water was leaving and then coming back, and then leaving and coming back, sloshing back and forth. If we filled this building full of water four feet deep, and we picked up one end of the building, the water would slosh down to one end, but it wouldn't stay there. It would slosh back and go down and come back and go down. And depending on numerous different features, the surface of the earth, you know, what's going on underneath, the shapes of it, how much water, et cetera, et cetera, what mountains are in the way, depending on many different features, uh, the water would slosh around for a long time, maybe weeks or months. And there may be, during this time, the last part of the year-long flood, I suspect, is when the mountains were formed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> if you have mountains lifting up and valleys sinking down, you would have Earth's crust movement, which may cause earthquakes, causing further tsunamis and tidal waves going back and forth. But <coughs> sedimentary rock is always laid down horizontally, as in with the horizon, flat. Sedimentary rock would be laid down flat, and then as the mountains lifted up, the water would rush off. This gives it energy. The water then is going to race back and forth. The waves are going to bounce back and forth across the oceans as soon as they run into something. And that would depend on so many factors, you know, the size of the ocean, the distance traveled, the depth of the water, how much energy is put into it. But those waves going back and forth are going to wash off the sediment layers and expose them already at twisted angles and deposit new layers on top. Now this in geology is called an unconformity, a place where the layers are crossing each other, but they obviously weren't laid down that way. Uh, Grand Canyon has a huge unconformity down at the bottom. This is a uh, uh, schematic of Grand Canyon calling, calling the, the angular unconformity where the layers were washed off and then new layers deposited on top, including lava flows. The letter H there is a lava flow. Well, anytime you get the crust of the earth being broken up and shifting around, you're going to have volcanoes going off. So probably during the flood, there, were there was volcanic action. After the flood, there was volcanic action. There's still volcanic action today. Um, <clears throat> the lava would be flowing uh, during this whole time from, from different areas. Uh, there could be a volcano erupting right now, but it doesn't affect us over here. That doesn't mean there were, the whole world was that way. There were patches of, uh, of turmoil and patches of tranquility. So underwater lava, when it comes up, it forms, uh, it's very distinctive from lava above water. It's called pillow lava. If you ever see it, um, a volcano erupting uh, under the ocean or something, it forms very distinctive layers, or, uh, like pillows. They call it pillow lava. And Mount Ararat, for instance, is pillow lava. Mount Ararat formed underwater. <coughs> well, today it's 17,000 feet above water. So something was different. Uh, <clears throat> here we show another schematic of the different uh, rock layers uh, in Grand Canyon. And of course, they've got them all named. The very top one is called Kaibab. Uh, the top of the canyon is called the Kaibab Uplift. Uh, did you guys stop and see Grand Canyon on the way here? Yeah. That's, we went to the Kaibab something like that. Yep. That's a big hole in the ground, isn't it? Very impressive. Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. It says, The ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Very interesting. <clears throat> if the ark rested in the seventh month, why didn't Noah get out until the thirteenth month? Why on earth would he stay in there for six more months? Probably several reasons why he would not want to get out right away. If the ark hit bottom in the seventh month, it doesn't mean, you know, the ark, the ark's probably stuck and can't move now, but the waves are still going back and forth across the ocean, and it's not, a safe, it's not safe to get out. There may still be further movement. Uh, Ron Wyatt thinks that Noah's ark hit bottom. <clears throat> they cut the anchor stones loose. Sometime later, a few weeks later, maybe a month later, because this was only the seventh month, and it wasn't until the 13th month that they got out. One of these waves could have lifted the ark up and moved it 10 miles and set it down somewhere else. Some of the anchor stones are found quite a ways away from the ark's location, if that is Noah's ark down in the valley. <clears throat> and again, some other creationist groups get mad at me for even mentioning that there might be another alternative besides the one they're promoting and raising mm -hmm. funding for. Uh, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 8, verse 5 says, The waters decreased continually. I think during this time, from the seventh month until the thirteenth month, when they actually got opened the door and got out, during this time, it is best to stay in the ark. The tidal waves outside made it 
not safe to get out. Secondly, there's nothing to eat out there. Now, during this, after seven months, many of the seeds that had been floating around would certainly germinate when they landed again. An awful lot of log mats would be floating around depositing seeds and uh, debris. And See, trees and many plants can grow several different ways. They can grow from seeds, of course. They can grow from cuttings. Some trees or bushes, you cut a branch off, stick it in the ground, and it grows. Others grow from roots. You know, the root sends out, and they call it a runner, sends up another uh, tree growing off this, uh, this root. So <clears throat> in addition to that, you have the animals and all the food on board that Noah brought for the animals to eat. They're going to continue as they take off out of the ark. You know, many animals uh, deposit seeds as they travel uh, along from the food that they're eating. So uh, there, it just was safe. To, it's better off to stay in the ark for a few more months, let everything get growing. Uh, Jan, you do a lot of gardening. Uh, you can plant a garden and raise it to eating height. Raise your tomatoes from seed to ready to eat in how long? Two, three, four months? Depends on conditions, but yeah, a couple of months, right? basically, it's ready to eat, right? Corn, plant the corn. Up in Illinois, where I'm from, you know, shoulder high by the 4th of July. It really grows, you know. It's different, different latitudes. You have a longer day up north in the summer, but a shorter season. So they end up getting the same number of hours of sunlight that we do down here, but uh, consequently, they have different planting times for the different crops. But still, it, within a few months, within five or six months, certainly, there was plenty of food outside that was just growing on its own from this flood. Uh, things left over in the mud that would begin to germinate and grow. So Noah got out. Okay, Hovind theory, point number seven. <clears throat> over the next few hundred years, <clears throat> the ice caps generally retreated. Don't forget, the ice now was all the way down to Kansas City, Missouri. Today, the ice caps are way up north. Just parts of northern Canada, you know, have these, these remaining ice caps. So over the next few hundred years, the ice caps generally retreated. The added water from the melting ice formed the continental shelf. As the cold water absorbed carbon dioxide, <coughs> lifespans shortened in the days of Pea Lake. Here's a map showing what the earth would look like if you lowered the water a couple hundred feet. Vietnam is now connected to Australia. Everything's connected. You know, you look at the globe and say, wow, that's a lot of water there. Well, yeah, but some of it's not very deep. <clears throat> Who remembers what the shallow part of the ocean is called? <coughs> Continental Shelf. And you go out to the deep part, which is called the abyss. Then in between the two, it rises up, called the Continental Rise. So that red line shows where the beach would be <clears throat> if you lowered the water a few hundred feet. All of the area around Indonesia, Java, Borneo, all that area is really very shallow water. Same thing out here, between here and Mexico. You know, the Gulf of Mexico, you, you could walk to Cuba if you lowered the water a few hundred feet. So as the ice melted back, it's going to raise the water an, an additional few hundred feet. And the ocean's average 12,000 feet deep. So a few hundred feet out of 12,000 is, is minimal, a few percentage points. Uh, <clears throat> there's a great book that you can get called Noah to Abram, The Turbulent Years. In this book, uh, this Dr. Von Fange deals with what did these people do after the flood? Apparently, they right away began building cities. <clears throat> Many of the cities later had to be abandoned as the water came up. Oops, we built too close to the beach. Let's clear out, go build somewhere else. Underwater cities are being found all over the world. It's pretty interesting under 150 feet of water. I'll show you some in a minute. But uh, Eric von Fange in his book here says that uh, probably right after the flood you would have some people who just plain didn't like city life and they would like the adventurous life so they would be uh, out traveling along the edge of the retreating ice age, ice pack, hunting the animals that are living there. Because as the ice melts back you got stuff, you know, new food beginning to grow. And some people just, they just prefer the hunt, the life of a nomad and a hunter. Other people got kicked out of their city, you know, criminals or whatever. People that are, have the nomadic form of life that are following animals, for instance, and, and living off of hunting these animals, like packs of mammoths or whatever, as they're traveling along, they don't want to carry a toolbox with them. They want to carry the minimum. So often they would make uh, stone tools on the job site. You killed an animal, okay, we got to skin them, we got to cut them up, we got to eat them. 
Make your tools when you're done, leave them. Move on to the next one. And very frequently, uh, this is what we find with these stone tools found all over the world. It looks like some of them were kind of hastily made. Well, they're only going to use it once, you know. Who cares? Other stone tools show just great craftsmanship where they really took their time to make gorgeous arrowheads and things like that. But this would, these factors would be involved of are they you know, chasing a herd of buffalo, following them across the countryside? If so, you're not going to carry your stone tools with you. Stones weigh a lot. Uh, this picture shows the underwater land bridge that would be exposed between Russia and Alaska. The water is just not very deep. As the ice melted back, it would leave behind the, all of the what we call ice age effects. I was in Pennsylvania a couple days ago, uh, preaching in northeast Pennsylvania. The whole area was covered by ice. And it's easy to tell if you know what to look for because there are rounded mountains called drumlins. See those on their mark drumlins? When the ice age, when glaciers move across an area, they'll take a, a mountain and round it off. And when the ice melts back, it leaves a very distinctive feature called a drumlin. Also, kettle lakes are little depressions in the ground full of water that um, probably form because of what's called isostatic rebound. As the ice melts back, the pressure, the weight of the ice is gone, and so the ground actually lifts up, trapping water all over the place. Minnesota is loaded with lakes, the land of 10,000 lakes. Most of them are kettle lakes. Most of them not very deep, uh, just trapped. D doesn't, water has nowhere to go. doesn't have an outlet. Um, you can see on the picture the terminal moraine on the far right. This would be where the ice bulldozed a pile of rocks up and then left it, retreated back. Along the sides of glaciers, it forms what are called lateral moraines. Uh, lateral meaning along the side. Anyway, the Earth has lots of uh, ice age effects that are easy to tell from those who study this, uh, that there was an ice age. How many have heard of the Matterhorn in uh, Switzerland, the famous mountain? You know. It had a glacier going down both sides of it because it carved part of the mountain away. So it's skinnier at the bottom and then tapers out and it goes back up to the point. It used to be just a big mountain, but parts of the side got eaten away, forming the, uh, the Matterhorn. It makes a, a U-shaped valley. It has one on several sides, making it very difficult to climb that mountain. Okay, Genesis 10:25. Interesting verse. It says, Unto Eber were born two sons. <clears throat> the name of the one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. Well, what happened in the days of Peleg? It says his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan means shorten. Peleg means divided. Very frequently in the Bible, the names have meanings. You know, the person's name indicates something that was happening at that time in history or um, some significant event. So Peleg means divided. Joktan means shortened. You notice on the chart here, Peleg was born 100 years after the flood. And Peleg only lived to be 239. His daddy lived to be 464. His grandpa lived to be 433. I mean, Peleg died uh, as an old man before his great-great-great-great-grandpa. Noah outlived Peleg. Shem outlived him by a long time. What happened in the days of Peleg? Uh, several different theories of what happened in the days of Peleg. The Bible doesn't tell us. It just simply says, in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. Um, apparently, whatever happened in the days of Peleg was genetic because everybody after him inherited it. Whatever it was, they all got it. Because everybody's lifespan dropped off to 200 and 200 and 200 and then down into the 100s. When you get to Abram, he's 175. He's considered a real old man. Actually, when Joseph was introducing his father Jacob to Pharaoh, Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? Jacob said, I'm 130, but this is nothing. Few and evil are the days of the years of my life been, but they've not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers. Jacob could have known Shem, Arphaxad, Selah, and Eber. Now, something to consider. What did these fellows do for 400 years? A lot of speculation in this area. The Bible doesn't tell us, okay? So we can make up all the stories we want. It could be that they were just 
retaining and spreading this incredible knowledge that had been amassed. How do you know which plants are poisonous? <clears throat> how do you know which herbs to take for different um, illnesses? Do you realize how much knowledge there is in the world? How many things there are to learn? How do you know how to take which rock contains iron and which one contains copper and how do you get it out and what do you do with it? And you know, If you think just in the science of metallurgy, you can study for a lifetime and never learn at all. Then you get into woodworking. How many different kinds of wood are there? And what are they good for? You know, cabinet making. There are thousands of, of areas of life where you can study for a life, lifetime and never learn it all. Um, <clears throat> so this knowledge would be retained by these guys. And he had a question. Like, you know, I call Bill Sardi when I got a question about health. You know, he's got all this, his brain is full of this, oh yeah, this vitamin does this and this vitamin does that. You know, he knows, okay. Well, some people have that knowledge of mechanics. Hey, my car's doing this, what do I do? Oh, and you, you, you learn as you go through life who to talk to with different questions. You know, nobody can know it all. But if you live to be 400, I bet you could learn to know it all. Or certainly a lot of it. <laughs> plus, <coughs> plus Noah, <coughs> excuse me, Noah lived to be 950. He lived, you know, a long time after the flood. Okay, in the days of Peleg, something changed. All we have is a few verses in the Bible and a few dates, and we have to guess from there. One theory says <clears throat> the languages were divided. Sometime during the days of Peleg, the languages were divided is one theory. The Bible doesn't tell us. You see, if we, I'll back up and show you the picture again. This genealogy chart is showing us the genealogy of Shem. Well, what happened to Ham and Japheth? Uh, the Tower of Babel was built by a guy named Nimrod, who's not in this genealogy. He was in a different family. But if you count how many generations it was from Noah to Nimrod, it would have been roughly the same time as the days of Peleg, even though the Bible doesn't tell us because it's not giving us the information for that particular family tree. It's giving us Shem's family tree, which is going to lead to Jesus Christ. But Nimrod would have been about the same time as, as Peleg. And as they built the Tower of Babel, God divided the languages. <clears throat> so one theory, and I think it's very reasonable, is that probably all that happened in the days of Peleg was the earth was divided by languages. Some people say, well, why would this shorten their lifespan? Well, if they had civilization going again, everybody's going pretty good, and all of a sudden it, it crumbles because now you got 70 or 80 different languages, and a lot of this knowledge is going to be lost. The guy that used to fix your car now speaks a different language. And you don't know how to do it. You know, the guy that knew how to, the guy that knew which herbs fixed which illnesses is now in a different country. And you can't talk to him. And it would take quite some time to learn these languages. At the same time, they're still just rebuilding civilization. It's been 200 years after this flood. There's still an awful lot to rebuild. And you're busy just surviving. You know, people on a Gilligan's Island situation don't have a lot of time to sit around and play cards. I mean, there's a lot to do just to survive. Uh, the people that moved out west, you know, uh, in the early days, they, they had to work 18 hours a day just to live, you know. Takes you three hours a day just to cook. Going to have chicken tonight. Well, that means you got to go catch the chicken first. <laughs> then you got to clean it and, you know, it's not just, you know, popping in the microwave. So uh, that's one theory. The second theory says that the continents moved. I don't believe this one. Because if you move a continent just a couple inches, it's going to kill everybody. It's going to create tidal waves and earthquakes. It's going to be devastating. It could be that there was some movement to the continents. There's still movement to the continents today. But <clears throat> it could be that after the flood, it, the earth settled for hundreds of years. It may still be settling today from that flood 4,400 years ago. What we see with earthquake activity and stuff like that might just still be leftover remnants from that flood. The earth is still not quite settled into place. <clears throat> Third theory, that says the earth was divided because the water came up. As the ice caps melted back, the water came up and divided the high spots into islands and continents. That is certainly a reasonable theory, and maybe several of these are true. Maybe there's some truth to each of these. I don't know. But 
If the ice is melting back, what's that doing to the ocean level? It's raising it. What used to be all connected, now all of a sudden, instead of mountains, you now have islands. And the area between becomes filled with water. So that's one theory. The fourth theory says the land was surveyed. By the days of Peleg, they got so many people, they said, look, let's quit fighting over who gets what. Okay, we're going to draw some lines. You know, you get from the tree to the bushes and to the river. You know, here's your property. Here's my property. Just like people have done for generations. You know, they divide up the land and they put up a fence and say, you know, this is my side. That's your side. Stay over there. Uh, I don't know if, I don't think that would have an effect on shortening lives, but number three certainly would. If the water is coming up, <clears throat> it's coming up because of ice melt, which is going to lower the temperature of the water. As water gets colder, it starts to absorb carbon dioxide. When your soda pop gets warm, it loses its fizz. Carbon dioxide is what they put into soda pop to make it fizzy. Okay? If it gets colder, it's going to absorb CO2. As it gets warmer, it loses CO2. So cold water would tend to absorb CO2 out of the oxygen, out of the air, out of the atmosphere. And CO2 is a greenhouse gas that is one of the many things that protects us from radiation. So if they began, 200 years after the flood, began to lose their protection from radiation, that may cause genetic factors to come in that they begin to live shorter lives because of increased radiation, because of decreased carbon dioxide, chain of events. Okay? So these ice caps are melting back, forming the glacier effects, and raising the oceans. As the oceans get more water in them, three things happen. They get wider, deeper, and colder. As the oceans get wider, this is going to create a continental shelf. It appears like that used to be the beach way out there. And it might have been the beach for a while until this, as the ice melted back. And I suspect in some areas, like in uh, Washington, where I just was in Dry Falls, Washington, there might have been, as the, as the ice was melting back, there might have been a giant lake dammed up. All of a sudden it gets too much water in it, and it all flows out. Great uh, Dry Falls, Washington, they say th there was more water going over that. There's no water over it now. I mean, it's a dry waterfall. But there was, there was more water going over that at one time than all of the rivers in all of the world combined. Well, probably that was a post-flood Ice Age lake. And it might have been 100 or 200 years after the flood. All of a sudden, all that water dumps through. It finally got enough melted back. As ice melts, it does funny things. Sometimes you have a glass of Coke with a bunch of ice in it, all of a sudden you hear a noise and it, it's flipping over. You know, uh, ice does all sorts of strange things as it melts back. And it may have trapped a large um, uh, lake right there in Dry Falls, uh, Washington, just about 100 miles from uh, Spokane. It's 100 miles to the left, uh, to the west. If you look at this map, you know the English Channel between England and, and France is less than 150 feet deep. 150 feet from here to the street. Not even that. That's 300 feet from here to the street. That's 30 miles wide. Get some graph paper and draw a graph showing what 30, 150 feet looks like on 30 miles. It's nothing. Um, France and England and Ireland and Scotland and Wales was probably all part of one big countryside. You could actually walk to Iceland. There might have been some uh, ice dams that broke loose and carved out little valleys later. But there is underwater erosion marks all over the place. Do you see between uh, Norway and Scotland, like that little valley underwater? Right about dead center in the picture. I bet there was some erosion, some water running into the North Sea. And the whole canyon is now underwater. It's filled in. Underwater erosion marks are very common all over the world. As the Atlantic Ocean filled in, it would finally spill backwards into the Mediterranean. Now let's suppose this happened uh, 200 years after the flood was over. In 200 years, how many people could there be on the Earth? You have no reason to not have lots of kids. As a matter of fact, it's an advantage to have lots of kids. You've got more hands to, to farm the land, you know, take care of things. So let's just suppose, if they're living to be 400 years old, 
Suppose they're having 40 kids per family, or 50 kids. You do that for 200 years, you got a population of thousands of people already. They're building cities. Now, if you're building a city in what is now the Mediterranean Sea, a couple of hundred years later, all of a sudden, the Mediterranean Sea fills in. Water comes up. Oops, we built our city too close to the beach. Let's get out of here. As it got a little deeper there, it would spill over past Sicily into the other half of the Mediterranean Sea. And then as it got deeper, it would spill back into the Black Sea. Here's an article. Um, Ancient Egyptian cities discovered under 30 feet of water in the Mediterranean Sea. Sea level was lower at some time in the past. Oh, I agree. And as all that water goes rushing in through the, by the Rock of Gibraltar, it's going to carve out that canyon between Africa, Morocco, and Spain, the Rock of Gibraltar. This water rushing in is finally going to backfill the Black Sea. That would probably be the last thing that happened. That might have been three or four hundred years after the flood by the time the Black Sea gets backfilled. So the water is probably running backwards through Istanbul, where Istanbul, Turkey is today, all the Straits of the Dardanelles. As this water went, now today it flows the other direction, but initially it would have flowed backwards. They found all sorts of cities under 150 feet of water in the Black Sea. You can see the old beach line, ancient shoreline on this picture. Well, yeah, I believe the Black Sea was probably smaller and it now has a flooded shelf. No question, not a problem with me. When this was discovered in 2000, the summer of 2000, the scuba divers discovered cities under 150 feet of water. Articles came out all over the paper. They said, oh, we have finally found evidence for Noah's flood. No, this is not evidence for Noah's flood. And they said, see, this city flooded and everybody drowned, and this is probably where the legend came from for Noah and the flood. Because it was a local little flood over there in uh, the Black Sea. No, no, uh, duh. <laughs> this is, Noah's flood was a worldwide flood. So I think the continental shelf and all the continental slope and all that stuff and continental rise is best explained by the ice caps melting back. Okay, today we still see the Earth's Earth showing effects of this devastating flood. Just about everything we see in the world can remind us of this flood. The hills, the valleys, the natural gas, the fossils, the coal, the oil. There are reminders everywhere to remind us of God's judgment. When you find a herd of dinosaur bones, you ought to conclude, you know, there was a disaster. This place was wrecked. But instead, Satan has twisted this where people see Grand Canyon and they think of millions of years instead of seeing Grand Canyon and thinking of flood. Satan has blinded the minds of those. Uh, of course, some of them don't want to believe anyway, so they, they would welcome any opportunity to doubt God's Word. There's a canyon I saw when I was in Idaho, a little bitty creek flowing at the bottom of this massive canyon that flows right into the Snake River. And you can just see flood written all over this place if you're willing to look for it. This uh, type of topography in this picture from Reader's Digest, Atlas of the World, shows <clears throat> what is called karst topography, where you have caves uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, the, the caves, the uh, limestone, erodes pretty quickly. Limestone is very susceptible to um, acid. If you put muriatic, muriatic acid, oh, which is hydrochloric acid, which your stomach produces, if you put it on concrete, it'll dissolve it. You can use mur mur muriatic acid, which you can buy at a swimming pool supply house for two bucks or three bucks a gallon. Sprinkle it on concrete, it'll start to eat the concrete away. And you can clean concrete or you can clean ceramic tile with this. Be sure to use a lot of ventilation. <laughs> you don't want to breathe that stuff. You take a whiff of that and it'll burn your nasal cavities, clear down to your toenails. But uh, I, somebody's going to write and say, oh, Hovind's stupid. He thinks toenails are connected to the nasal cavities. Uh, no, I don't. It's a joke. Okay, lighten up. Uh, <laughs> I talk I taught anatomy. I know they're not connected. But I, people ridicule me over the silliest thing. Anyway, um, the coal is often found in layers. They use strip mining to dig the coal out. Layer of dirt, layer of coal. Another layer of dirt, another layer of coal. I think the best explanation for the karst topography and uh, all of the top topography of the oceans of the world, of the Earth's crust, is the flood. There's a great book by Walt Brown uh, called about the hydroplate theory. Uh, his version of the flood, or his description of it, is slightly different than mine. But uh, 
I, he, he, he does not believe there was a canopy before. I think there had to be for several reasons, but he still has a great book and I recommend it. I tell people I learned years ago to eat the meat and spit out the bones, you know. I can learn things from some people and, and not believe everything they believe. I can learn things from a Mormon and Jehovah's Witness and a Buddhist, you know. Uh, perfectly fine. You can learn stuff from everybody. This is an interesting fossil. We're going to close here with this. Um, there's a picture of a fish eating another fish. Either that or the little one is a dentist. I don't know. But <clears throat> neither one of them thought they were going to die that day. They were caught in the middle of supper, turned into a fossil. Had to be buried extremely quickly for this to happen. Fish fossils are found with the gills extended, the fins extended in, uh, in obvious positions of terror. They're scared. Wow, what's going on? Probably buried in underwater landslides or just simply all of a sudden the water becomes like a giant mud puddle and they can't breathe. And so they're panicking. Ah, oh, I'm suffocating. You know, fish can suffocate too. You know, fish can drown, believe it or not. Uh, so they're swimming along and they're terrified by what's happening and they, they die and get packed into situations like this. Now, I get a lot of letters. People will say, see, that picture you show of the fish eating other fish proves they weren't vegetarian before the flood. Well, a couple of problems with that. We don't know for sure when this fossil formed, okay? It, I think it probably formed because of the flood, but it may have been later. Secondly, I don't know that fish are considered alive in the biblical sense. Though they don't have nostrils, they don't have the breath of life, that's for sure. So it could be that a fish is just considered a, self, a complicated, self-replicating food source as opposed to live, like with a, with a spirit, like an animal. Has a, this, a spirit goes back to God that gave it, it says in the book of Ecclesiastes about the animals. So I don't think insects either are alive in the biblical sense. As far as people say, well, Adam might have stepped on an ant and killed it, see, and there would have been death before sin. That's a stretch. First you have to define what is life before you can define what is death. And I don't think you could prove that insects have life in the same sense that man has life or animals have life. Okay. Bible tells us, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Uh, this guy, Harry Truman, lived on the side of Mount St. Helens when it was about to blow up. Tim Behrens, uh, his KJSL radio station, I'm on every Wednesday morning with Tim and Al, uh, St. Louis station. Tim Behrens witnessed to Harry Truman, not the president, okay, to this Harry Truman. He said, Harry was a very profane man. About every other word was a cuss word. He listened very carefully about the gospel and then rejected it, refused Jesus Christ. When the volcano blew, Harry was still there. They told him, Harry, this volcano is going to blow up. He said, I've been living here for 80 years and I'm staying right here. Well, he stayed right there. Still there, matter of fact, they never did find him after the eruption. He's probably under 80 feet of mud right now or 300 feet of ash. But uh, that's so silly to know the volcano is going to blow up and not get off. Well, folks, we've been warned the entire earth is going to blow up. You better get ready for that. You better accept Jesus Christ. Just like there was warning before Mount St. Helens blew, there is warning from Scripture before the earth falls apart. You better get in Christ. You better be saved or you're in trouble someday. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So I recommend everybody uh, get, get saved. The Bible tells us about the flood in Matthew 24. Uh, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered into the ark, and knew not, till the flood came and took them all away. So also, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, just like the flood is a good symbol or typology of uh, what in the days of Noah, people, the world earth was destroyed, that's a symbol or a good typology of what's happening today. How many people listen to Noah? Just almost nobody. Noah's job was to preach, whether they listen or not. Our jobs do the same thing. Some are going to listen, some aren't. Oh well. After the break, we'll take up uh, what we cover on our videotape number seven, question answer uh, session. Uh, coming up right after the break, and we should in the next four classes or five classes be able to finish, I hope, uh, everything we have on uh, videotape uh, 7 uh, Q&A. So let's take a little break, come right back.
All right, welcome back. Now we're going to start into what is on our seminar part seven question answer session. This is where we throw everything else we don't have time to cover in our seminar. The uh, uh, pot pie, the leftovers, all goes into this, things I didn't have time or didn't have interest in covering in the seminar. So we're going to cover a wide variety of topics in no particular order. Uh, if you're trying to put order to this, good luck. If you do get a good order to it and can write an outline, send it to me, I'll use it, okay? Because <laughs> we, don't, we don't have one <laughs> for part seven. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter seven. Solomon said, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. I think it's interesting that God made the brain so that it can store information. And also, he gave us a curiosity to want to know things. There's just a lot of things to learn in this world and it's exciting to, to learn, okay? First Peter chapter three. It says, be ready always to give an answer. One of our jobs as Christians, as children of God, is to be able to give an answer to those who would like to know. We need to study, according to 2 Timothy 2, 5, 15. Study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, first question we're going to cover, because I get this all the time in my debates and stuff. The skeptics will say, well, don't all scientists believe in evolution? What they're trying to imply by that is, since you don't believe in evolution, you can't be a scientist. If your definition says, in order to be a scientist, you have to believe in evolution, then, if, I mean, if that's the way you're going to define it, then of course all scientists believe in evolution, by your definition. <laughs> but who, gets, who decides who's a scientist anyway? I mean, who's making this call? You know, is there a committee someplace that's voting on this? Who makes the decision? Um, of course, according to the Mormons, you know, you can't, you can't be godly unless you're a Mormon. And according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, you can't be God unless you're one of them. I mean, every group does this. And the scientists often are no different. They think, well, you can't be a scientist unless you believe in evolution. So therefore, if you don't believe in evolution, you are not a scientist. In John chapter 7, in verse number 40, very interesting passage here, and I'll watch this carefully. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among them, because among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? And the officers said, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? This people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Okay, let's stop right here and look at some of the logic here. The people divided over a question. I thought the Bible says Christ comes out of Bethlehem and this guy comes out of Galilee. Right away, they're arguing about the wrong subject, aren't they? They didn't have all the knowledge they needed to make this argument. Jesus did come from Bethlehem, didn't he? He's born in Bethlehem. He grew up in Galilee. So when the scripture said he comes out of Bethlehem, it's exactly correct. So here they are arguing about the wrong subject, vehemently, divided over this, okay? Then the chief priests sent the officers to get him. Why didn't they go? I see this all the time in debates, you know, or in seminars. There'll be a group of students that'll come from some university, and they come with a list of questions to ask me, to trick me. I say, where did you get those questions? Well, from my professor. Why didn't he come? He sends the students. I answer all their questions. They leave confused. They go back to their professor, and then he makes fun of them for being so stupid that they couldn't trick me. Watch what happened here. The guys came back and the Pharisees said, why didn't you take him? And they said, nobody ever spoke like this guy. Then their logic, watch the logic here. It's exactly what happens today on the creation evolution topic. No different. They, they said, are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? What are they trying to imply by that? Since none of us guys who know the Bible believe in him, therefore he can't be right. This is what some of the scientists will say. Well, how many scientists believe in creation? Same kind of thing, okay? Since no scientists believe in creation, therefore it must not be true. Well, first place, 
A lot of scientists believe in creation, okay? And secondly, I'd like to find out who's, who's deciding, who's a scientist. So they started with a false assumption that Jesus was from Galilee. And since the Pharisees had not believed on him, they used that as proof that, he, that it was, he was not right. Same thing today. The scientists will say, well, because most scientists believe in evolution, therefore evolution must be true. Well, talk about flawed logic from the start. Okay? No, all scientists don't believe in evolution, for one thing. And even if they did, that still would mean nothing in an argument. They'll say, has he published in major science journals? Well, suppose in order to publish a paper in a science journal, you have to publish something that doesn't go against the evolution theory. If your article smacks of creationism, it'll be rejected. Same thing happened in the Soviet Union 15 years ago. Suppose you got up in front of your class of kids in the Soviet Union and said, boys and girls, I don't believe in communism. Doesn't work. Capitalism is a much better system. What would happen? You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be teaching tomorrow, would you? You'd be lucky to be alive tomorrow, right? So then the teachers get up in front of their students and say, all the teachers believe in, in communism. Therefore, it must be right. Uh, no, therefore, it must be ruthless. <laughs> right? <clears throat> and if they say, all scientists believe in evolution, well, it's not true, but if, even if it was true, that still wouldn't prove it's right. That might just prove it's ruthless. In other words, if you don't believe in it, you'll get fired. And I'll show you some examples where they did get fired here in a second. The majority followed Aaron into rebellion in Exodus chapter 32. The majority voted not to go into the promised land. Remember that? Ten to two. The majority was wrong, all right? The majority followed false gods many times throughout the Old Testament. They were wrong. The majority of religious leaders hated Jesus. They were wrong. The majority of the Roman Empire hated Christians. Majority opinion means nothing in an argument. And many thousands of scientists with degrees from major universities do believe in creation. But you don't have to have a degree from a university to be a scientist. Many people down through history didn't even finish high school and became great inventors and great scientists, you know. They just had uh, a desire to learn, a desire to use what they had learned to improve things or invent new things. Now, the guy who has the patent uh, on the MRI machine is a creationist. Robert Gentry, who, uh, um, who lost his job at uh, the uh, not Battelle, uh, Oak Ridge Laboratories in Knoxville, Tennessee, because they found out he was a creationist. He wrote the book that we, have, that we sell called uh, Creation's Tiny Mystery about the radio polonium halos. He was one of the world's experts on uh, granite because he was assigned the task of you know, deciding where do we put radioactive waste. You know, after a nuclear power plant gets done, you got this barrel of radioactive material, what do you do with it? You don't, want, you don't want it in your backyard, that's for sure. So they dig deep holes and they bury it in granite. Well, as they were sampling, taking samples of granite from all over the world, Robert Gentry is looking at these things under the microscope and he finds out they have little rings in them, circles, called radiopolonium halos. And we'll get into that later, how it absolutely proves the earth was created cold, like the Bible says, and the earth is not billions of years old. And so his articles are being published in all the major magazines all over the world, Science Magazine, Nature Magazine, everybody publishes this amazing stuff by Robert Gentry about this new find of radiopolonium halos. Until somebody figured out, you know, this proves the Big Bang Theory is not true. Oh, oh, well, they shut him off like a spigot, man. He couldn't get anything published anywhere because it didn't go along with the evolution theory. So he lost his job in grant money. Roger DeHart was told he could not inform students of errors in the textbooks by passing out articles from current science journals. All he did in his science class, he never talked about creation. He would just say, uh, kids, in this book right here on page 95 is an article about, you know, such and such. But this has been proven wrong. Here's a current science journal so showing where it's been proven wrong. Pass it out. Can you imagine that? He was called in to say, you cannot inform the kids of more recent research that goes against the textbook. What on earth is somebody thinking? But he, he was told, you can't do that. Because it went against the evolution theory. Kevin Haley was a biology teacher at Oregon Community College. He lost his job for simply exposing errors in the textbooks. He is a creationist, but he never told them he was. He just showed them, hey, here's an error in our textbook. This is wrong. Okay? At Baylor University in Waco, Texas, 
Uh, William Dembski, in April of 2000, was fired because he advocated intelligent design instead of evolution. He just said, you know, this is, things we study are so, uh, so complex, they must have been designed. Well, that's all it takes. He's out of there. Baylor, Southern Baptist School, you know, fired. <coughs> Forrest Mims was a science writer for 20 years. He published articles in National Geographic, in Science Digest, the American Journal of Physics. Sixty magazines and newspapers published his articles. He was denied a job as a, scientific, as a writer for Scientific American because he was a creationist. Subjects he would write on were not even involving creation or evolution. But because he believed in creation, he couldn't even write on other topics. Then the scientists would turn around and say, well, how many creationists are writing for major magazines? Well, duh, yeah. How many capitalists are teaching in Soviet Union? You know, it's the same thing. No, no difference whatsoever. Rod Levake in Fairbault, Minnesota, uh, was reassigned to a different position because he even raised doubts about Darwin's theory. Don't even make the kids question this. If you do, you're not qualified to be a biology teacher. Get that guy out of biology class. Put him somewhere else. The guy that wrote the book uh, that we carry, Pandas and People, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, one of the authors of that book was a uh, major biology teacher for years at Sanford or s one of the San Francisco colleges. Um, when he began, when he be got saved, he used to write textbooks about evolution. Textbooks that people would use in schools about evolution. When he got saved and became a creationist, they tried to fire him. But because he had 20 years, uh, he was tenured professor, they couldn't fire him, so they reassigned him as a lab assistant. Usually college juniors and seniors are the lab assistants. Here, go wash these test tubes, you know, clean this mess up. The guy had, uh, had written books about evolution, but once he became a creationist, oh, he's out the door. Okay, you can no longer be a uh, scientist if you don't believe in evolution. This is the logic that we have to face. John chapter 7. Shall Christ come out of Galilee? They're arguing about the wrong thing. So when they say, don't all scientists believe in evolution? I'm sorry, they're arguing the wrong subject. The average person can see the truth. Many of the people, therefore, said, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? See, the Pharisees didn't believe in him, but the common person could see. The average ordinary person with half, half a brain and, and normal intelligence can see evolution is not true. It can't happen. But the scientists get together and say, oh, well, all scientists believe in it. And if you don't believe in it, you're going to be fired, by the way. You know, go, go, go get them evolution, you know. That's what's going on. Okay. Some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Same thing today. There are some people who teach evolution and believe in evolution that would, would love to have anybody that doesn't believe it. They, they hate people like me. I get hate mail all the time. You know, it's, it's hilarious to read some of the stuff. Nearly always unsigned. One guy wrote a letter to some great preacher years ago. Just one word on the letter. Fool! Sent it to the preacher. The preacher got up that night in front of this, I think it was uh, Billy Sunday or something. He got up in front of this crowd of 10 or 15,000 people and said, well, I get letters all the time that are anonymous, but I finally got one that he signed his name but forgot to write the letter. <laughs> the Pharisee said, why have you not brought him? Why didn't you bring him to us? Yeah, the professor sent their students to do the dirty work. They didn't go themselves. And scientists today and evolutionists today will try to use the law to silence creationists. They'll try to pass a law or try to twist the law to say you can't talk about creation in schools. Rather than just deal with the subject, if evolution is so true, prove it to us and we'll shut up. Just prove it. <laughs> Show us the evidence. Uh, have any of the, are you also deceived? Translated means, are you stupid? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? In other words, hey, all scientists believe it, therefore it must be true. John 7 49 says, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. What are they trying to imply by that? You're stupid. We're smart. Can you read that into that pretty easily? We're smart. You're dumb. 
I get this attitude all the time when I do debates. And I have people get up and they'll say, you know, the, the evolutionist will say, well, the average person doesn't understand the complexity of this topic. And I'll say to the audience, now folks, let me translate what he just said. What he just said is, you're stupid, he's smart. You're too dumb to understand. And then I'll say, how many of you believe that that's what he just implied? And every hand goes up, you know. <laughs> of course that's what he implied. You know, I'm, too, I'm smart, you're too dumb to understand, you know, the complexity of evolution. Basically, if you disagree with me, you must be dumb. That's what they're trying to not say. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and knoweth what, not what he doeth, and knoweth what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look. For out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Again, arguing about the wrong subject. But even some of the non-believers had sense enough to listen to reason, like Nicodemus, and think about the other side. Go home and think about it. If you're a scientist and you believe in evolution, that's certainly your privilege. You have the right to do that. But at least think about what the other people are saying. Think about the creationist view. Don't just discount it. There is probably more peer pressure in the scientific community than there is in the average fifth grade class. You know, fifth graders, they've got to wear the right clothes because of their friends, you know, or seventh graders, you know. They're scared of peer pressure. What are my friends going to think? Scientists are much worse at that. There's peer pressure in the scientific community. We need somebody with some backbone to say, I don't care what anybody says, you know. I'm doing what's right. Here's a list of some of the major scientists of the past who were creationists. Nearly every branch of science in the world was started by somebody who believed in creation. Uh, Francis Bacon invented our scientific method. He was a creationist. Johann Kepler, the great astronomer, was a creationist. I won't read them all to you, but there are thousands and thousands of people who are creationists. Um, Cotton Mather, the physician, was a creationist. Uh, John Woodward, uh, paleontology. Now people began to use the research of these guys and twist it into um, evolution. And some of these guys were old earth uh, compromisers. They, were create they believed there was a creator, but thought maybe the earth was millions of years old. Especially those in the early 1800s, when it really became uh, a lot of peer pressure to teach the earth was old and try to fit it into the Bible with the gap theory and the day-age theory. That started way before Darwin, early 1800s. Uh, <clears throat> Carolus Linnaeus, who invented our classification system that we still use today, you know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Uh, he was a creationist. Uh, all through history, you can see these people were creationists. <clears throat> John Dalton, uh, George Cuvier, he was a compromiser, but um, many of these folks, uh, they believed, look, there had to be a creator. And they started whole branches of science that are uh, still in existence today. A lot of geologists were creationists. Samuel Morse invented the telegraph and the Morse code uh, creation, or invented the Morse code anyway. Uh, the um, Charles Babbage, operations research, computer science, wouldn't have computers if it weren't for the research of guys like this that were uh, creationists. Luis Agassi did a lot of study on glaciers, was a creationist. Today, Stephen Gould, a Marxist communist professor at Harvard University, works in the Agassi Museum, named after a creationist. See some, uh, boy, I can stop and talk about many of these guys, you know, uh, James Jewell, thermodynamics. Uh, the Jewell is named after him, you know, a, a unit of energy, named after James Jewell. <clears throat> Louis Pasteur, pasteurized milk. Any milk carton, I'll remind you of creation, if you see a pasteurized down there from Louis Pasteur's name. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell, electrodynamics, uh, st uh, statistical thermodynamics. All through history, th these folks were creationists. I'll just page down real slowly and let you look at some of the names. Uh, Andros Fleming, uh, uh, Wilder Smith had three doctoral degrees in sciences, was a creation science pioneer, and spoke prolifically on creation, just died here recently. So many people today are scientists and are creationists. Many people are actually afraid to let people know they're creationists for fear they'll lose their job because it does happen. Okay, there is a discrimination against creationists. Okay, next question. What about separation of church and state? Well, there's no such phrase in the Constitution. There's no such thing as separation of church and state. 
That sentence was used by Thomas Jefferson in a letter written to Pastor Danbury, a Baptist in Dayton, Connecticut in 1802. Jefferson said, The First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state. By the way, uh, wallbuilders.com, <clears throat> David Barton has a great ministry, he said that wall is a one-dimensional wall. It keeps government from running the church, but it makes sure that Christian principles will always stay in government. The same day they voted in the amendments to the Constitution, the Ten Amendments, including the First Amendment, same day they voted to give $500 to a Catholic priest to help the Indians in St. Louis. Well, now, obviously these guys weren't thinking of total separation between church and state, were they? Same guys, same day, voted that money to a Catholic priest. Okay, uh, lots more on separation of church and state on video number four. It's perfectly fine, though, for the church to influence the state. They're supposed to try to influence the state. What's happened in the last hundred years particularly, many churches <clears throat> have given up being churches and become corporations. Once a church becomes a 501c3 corporation in order to get, give a tax write-off, that, that's their excuse, and it goes back to the love of money, root of all evil. They are now not really a church anymore. They're an agent of the state. See, the state gives corporations the right to exist. God gives His church the right to exist. And one of the dumbest things any church could do would be to become a 501c3 corporation. We cover well, lots more of that on video number five of our series about churches incorporating. Major mistake. And it's easy to get out of, to undo that. You can contact Pastor Mooneyhan if you want more information on how to get unincorporated. His number is 352-498-0384. I call him about once a week. You know, I have different questions on things. He's coming here tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Uh, okay, next week we'll take up more questions and answers from our uh, frequently asked uh, question section. Uh, what's on our videotape number seven. And try to finish in the next four or five weeks, whatever we've got left in this class, and get everything done on our Q&A. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.